Madison's former police chief has some ideas for improving our nation's police. You'll learn what they are and why they're needed this morning on For the Record. Good morning, I'm Neil Heinen. Between 1972, when he was hired in Madison, to about 1993 or so, when he retired as chief to become an Episcopal minister, David Cooper transformed the Madison Police Department from a primarily white male military style department to a diverse, highly educated, well-trained, sophisticated department committed to quality and the citizens it serves. What is striking is how little so much of law enforcement in America has changed along with it. Much of what was wrong with law enforcement in the 70s is still wrong. David Cooper thinks he knows why and how it can change, and he joins me this morning. Chief, nice to see you again. Great to see you. Um, the book is called Arrested Development. A veteran police chief sounds off about protest, racism, corruption, and the seven steps necessary to improve our nation's police. Came out just a couple of weeks ago. You're touring around the country um, uh, talking about the book. Pretty much local right now, yeah. but, but did go back to Minneapolis, my old haunts, where I sort of uh, grew up there and uh, started policing and was at the university. And then, and then we're doing a number of them around um, about five or six around Madison. We've done two now. And then we're going to do um, one in Milwaukee. A bookstore there. Now it's been almost 20 years since you left yeah. the police department. <laughs> um, you're you're an Episcopal minister, but it, it does beg the question: Why this book now? Yeah. Well, I think it's it's a book that I certainly couldn't have written. We we did we did something. Uh, my wife and I did, collaborated on a book on on uh, quality policing, the Madison experience in the in the late 90s or early 90s. But uh, I think I needed this perspective, which I probably didn't have. Um, and I think my sort of role as, as a clergy person, uh, dealing with uh, parishioners who get in trouble and things, kept me looking, looking at the police. And the sort of expectation that I had was that, that things will keep rolling forward in a way in which um, which we'd gotten used to, that things would, would progress, that these ideas. I mean, I taught seminars throughout the country. I figured we were on the same page and things would go forward. But then a few years later, when I got invited back to uh, Washington for, for a um, high-level meeting of our nation's uh, chiefs from the largest cities, I was um, greatly disappointed. You, have, you, you, you point out the four major causes of problems here. Tell us what those yeah. are first. Well, the first is, and, and, and this, is, this is a tough one, and it has to do with uh, how we prepare police, but there is within the ranks of a police a, um, an attitude of anti-intellectualism. Um, that is basically that uh, higher education isn't really that important if we have to have it. Let's have it be technical and let us not, you know, getting into the traditional liberal arts education and sort of to disdain research and the idea that someone could develop uh, ideas maybe outside of policing that we could use. And it even goes uh, as deep as saying, well, what applies to your department can't apply to mine. You know, just every, every cycle of new police leadership, somebody comes in to reinvent the wheel. There's not a growing body of knowledge. So that anti-intellectualism sits as a really major, major point, followed up by, by violence. We've got to have more than just one arrow in the quiver uh, when, uh, when you go to handle problems. Can't uh, always um, resort to, to force. Uh, so the, the quickness to use force, whether it be pepper spraying or, or moving people out of Occupy uh, settlements, um, that has continued to be a problem. The other one, to continue in many of our larger cities has to do with just endemic corruption. Uh, it's, it, it is not that the police are violating the law to, to uh, line their own pockets, which is one part of that, but also violating the law to get the bad guys off the street. And both of those things seem to, to occur, and it has to do with, with, with ethics. Um, the third area um, has, a, has or the, um, the, the fourth, fourth area, area. Uh, outside of corruption, has to do with something that I think is as, as essential as the other three, and that has to do with um, inculcating a sense of a civility, of courtesy within the police, which I think is the whole 
stop and frisk uh, problem that's going on in New York City right now. It's about the fact that that people's dignity are, are, is being stripped away as the police are stopping them. There's no. I, I think there's a way to do this. I think you can do things respectfully. You can put people in jail, jail without stripping away their dignity on the way. So those four things, this anti-intellectualism, the um, propensity to use violence, demi-corruption, and incivility, discourtesy has been, I think, the four obstacles that have to be overcome if our police are going to move forward. In the, in the 80s, say, if, uh, uh, I guess I was under the impression that that this this was a movement, even an unstoppable movement. The the, the idea of policing uh, being focused on on quality, being focused on community policing, and what was necessary there, which would require perhaps some more highly educated, highly trained police sure. officers. All these it seemed to be a trend. Are, 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 is what we're seeing law enforcement agencies that have just never changed? Or has it slid back, David? That well, I, I think the attitude today is that uh, the technology will save us. Uh -huh. And I think that's a really dangerous attitude. If we just get better software, more sophisticated forensic uh, tools, um, better radios, um, better communication devices, that that's going to save us better records keeping and so forth. But policing has always been about the personal. It's never been about you know, the technology. So I think there's a there's a sense in relying on that. If you, if I take a look at um, at, the, at the journal that is uh, sort of uh, that I read for years and uh, the organization of which I've been, been a life member, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Um, every month I get that magazine. It is overwhelmingly 90 plus percent on technology. Very very few articles talk about the personal aspects of policing, and I can't ever recall there being a book review. Now if I compare that with the, with the career, the, the occupation I moved into now, into the clergy, is that my professional magazines are, are filled, with, filled with book reviews. Uh, uh, and not only that, my colleagues are writing books. I don't feel that there's any necessity that I need to say anything so far that hasn't been said in the area of ministry. I mean, I, my colleagues do this. I'm excited by their ideas. They're always pushing on the edge of things, and it's an exciting place to be in. But I look back. You know, that really hasn't hasn't happened, though I, I thought it would be. And as a as a 20-something year old um, uh, on the uh, Minneapolis Police Department, working the night shift on the tactical squad, I read the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Policing, and said, "Look it." Um, Police need to have four-year college degrees, and we need to start that right now. And there's a, something called a police agent. We need to have police community relations units. We need to get closer to our people. I mean, I became excited, and that excitement has carried me throughout all, all, all these years. Well, I want to <laughs> I want to talk about the Madison experience to put some context to this, and we'll do that when we come back right after this. I am back with former Madison Police Chief David Cooper, whose new book, Arrested Development, uh, looks at the four causes of, of problems in law enforcement today and some solutions that we're going to get to in a minute. The book is available on Amazon.com. It's also available at A Room of One's Own and, and local bookstores. Um, and uh, my guess is if you went over to Barnes & Noble, they would order it for you. It's a fascinating book. And for those of us who have been around for a while in this city, um, I just I think it would be useful to just describe the Madison Police Department. I, a lot of people watching this show, I think, would just simply take it for granted. Yes. Um, but well. the fact of the matter is it's a tough job to get. I mean, it, there's a, a lot of applicants for every position. They tend to be disproportionately educated, disproportionately experienced in areas outside of law enforcement. Yeah. 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 And it yeah. shows up in a culture, I guess, of law culture. enforcement in this, yeah. in this community. Yeah. That's why we have been, oh, over the years, so, um, so wedded to the idea that we would do our own six-month academy because we wanted to teach the Madison Method to people. To go to a technical college for for that type of education, we thought was that we would be missing the boat, um, and I don't know how that will will, will turn out. I think there's got to be better collaboration between between um, 
locally with the MATC and also with the University of Wisconsin, which does have a criminal justice um, a focus. So, um, you know, training, you know, this is the way we do things and having older people who are experienced and have, uh, are educated is a tremendous advantage. And then you've got to look at, well, then how are you going to do that training? The, the frightening statistics out there is that fully half of all police academies in the United States use what they themselves identify as the stress-based model. Now, I know all about stress-based model from my time in the Marine Corps. I mean, I know what that's like. I also know that there's very, very little, if any, similarities between what I was asked to do as a marine rifleman and as a urban police officer. So the two are, are, are very separate, but we have a tendency to sort of bring them together, to think that you can you know, demean and um, you know, drop and give me 10 push-ups to, to educated people that you expect to be, uh, respect the dignity of other people. It's a, it's a crazy thing. And, my book, I tell a story of going to a very large uh, police department out of the, near, near the West and uh, coming in to teach a three-day leadership, uh, leadership training course, which I did, and um, getting there early, and uh, the classroom was out at the recruit training academy, and I look out the window, and the recruits are all lined up and everything, and uh, there's a, you know, police instructors out there with uh, Marine Corps Smokey Bear hats on and uh, campaign hats, and they're, uh, they're swearing at three at recruits and um, having them do push-ups and everything. And when the command staff came in, I said, uh, well, I just, just have one question I'd like to ask before we get started here. Uh, do you encourage your recruits to your officers to uh, swear at citizens? I said, oh, absolutely not. Where'd you, where'd you get that idea? Well, just look out the window because that's what you're training them to do. Mm -hmm. So we we developed something we called uh, quality leadership, and it comes a, a lot from the teachings of, um, of Dr. Tom Gordon and Deming and, and um, Robert Greenleaf's uh, servant leadership. And the idea here was that was that you can you can you can listen and ask your employees about how to do things the best way, and that you treat them with dignity and respect, and they will in turn treat citizens. So that was a big. Um, a big step in the front end, you know. It's not only to have that vision, you know, my first step is to have the envision, a uh, bold and breathtaking um, vision of where you want to go, and I think we had that in Madison. So as this book is just uh, being finished up and you're starting to blog about it and posting some things on Facebook, we get, we get that image out of Berkeley of the, of the police officer with the tear gas yeah. right yeah. in the face yeah. of a protester yeah. who is simply sitting on the ground. Yeah. Someone told me the other day that the police were criticized uh, some, some place down south or something to uh, where you used a pepper spray with a bunch of middle schoolers who weren't behaving themselves. But, but I've, I've not run that down that story yet, but I certainly do know the University of California at Davis uh, kind of a, iconic incident out there. Was that Davis? I yeah, said well, Berkeley. It was, it was, it was Kel Davis. Davis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, it could right, have right. been Berkeley. Yeah. And I, in my book, I talk a lot about my own experience at Berkeley as a young police officer trying to learn crowd control. But I mean, isn't that, I mean, crowd control and dealing with protests yeah, is yeah. really r fundamentally at the heart of yeah. a lot well, of this. Well, I say it's the, it's the hallmark of police in a democracy, how police handle public protest. And so you have the, the tear gas spraying there, which when I first saw it, I, I kept on saying, what were they thinking? You know, what, what went through their minds? So sometimes you make bad mistakes because you're being pressured, like if you look at those old tapes from Dow Chemical. Yep. You, I mean, it is, a, it is just an um, example of when people get scared and there's, nobody's in charge and there's pushing and shoving, mistakes are made. This seems to be more, more calculated. You know, so what in the world were, were we thinking? And do we ever think well, how's this going to play? You know, here we are. You know, how how is this going to look to the rest of the world? How would you analyze the state capitol protests, David? Did you did you watch those? And well, I was down. I was I was down there. I could, well, I mean, had to be there to see what was going on. Um, well, that that I think uh, turned out very well. And you know, sometimes the best thing to do is to do nothing, and that's really hard for 
for mayors and uh, other elected officials, governors, to do do nothing because there's pressure. You know, well, I thought you were in charge. Do something. So I think a lot of uh, elected officials and police chiefs get sort of bullied into doing something. You know, and I think that's probably the issue we're going to have here in Madison over the Occupy. But back to the Capitol, I think that it was it was very well done. People have come up to me, aren't you proud of that? And I said, yes, you know, I really am. I think that's a great job. But but I also had a little caveat to that, and that is when when the people, the police are protecting and monitoring there, uh, have, a, have a similar um, value set as they do, it's a, it's a lot easier to be, be nicer. I said the test for the Madison Police Department state in the future is going to be when police come to a scene of a protest in which they absolutely despise what it is the protesters are doing yeah. and still can treat them with dignity and respect. And that was, that was the core of what we went through in the civil rights and the anti-war. That is the place where we're vehemently opposed in many cases to what black citizens were doing about the Jim Crow segregation laws. Police were opposed to these anti-war people because many of them had been in the military. I mean, there used to be a requirement you had to be in the military. Uh, I had to be, my first police job, I had to be married, I had to be in the military, and I had to be six feet tall. <laughs> That would rule out a lot of <laughs> Madison cops. We're going to come back and talk about what can be done about this right after this. My guest this morning is a longtime friend, Madison Police Chief David Cooper, former Madison Police Chief David Cooper, although he hired the current Madison Police Chief. And uh, David Cooper has written a book called Arrested Development, uh, looking at law enforcement today and looking at it through the lens of his own personal experience, but also more than 20 years as chief of the Madison Police Department. And we've spent most of this show already, David, talking about what's wrong uh, with law enforcement today. But you've got some pretty clear ideas about how to fix it. Yes. Tell, tell us what are the, the most important ones. Well, I talk, I said about these, these, these seven steps. The first I talk about is to envision. You need to have a, a vision of where you want to go. And... Um, and in my own case, back uh, back in early early '73, it was the downtown Rotary Club that gave me a chance to really lay this out about what kind of police officer I was looking at. It would be a, a community worker, uh, uh, a social worker in blue, uh, who would have a, a wide variety of, of, of options. Would grow with the job, and um, and we we continued um, uh, trying to cast that vision out. So you've got to have where you want to go. If you don't have a direction where you want to go, you're not going to get there. And the second thing was the very, very important of hiring the best and brightest. You know, we used to put up big billboards, I got a picture of it in the book, join the other Peace Corps to attract somebody who maybe had not thought about being a police officer before. And, um, and hiring them is very important. And then once you get them uh, hired, you know, being able to listen to them and that was uh, developing a collaborative leadership which flattens the organization, which, um, which encourages uh, the leaders within the organization to, to you know, do a 360 check to see, get feedback from their people they're responsible for, leaders on their same level as well as their bosses, and to see, you know, to be able to listen. Um, and in my case, when I started this, involved uh, 26 employee meetings <laughs> in the early 1980s, in which um, I'd come home at night and um, just wanted to go to bed and sob. It was, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was a major, yeah. major uh, shift for me. So being able to, to develop um, that listing, and I, I also put in there, you know, train and lead. You've got to really do adult training, adult modeled training, and, and leaders who are, who are mature, who can... Um, who can listen to their employees, uh, can improve systems, those kinds of quality uh, instruments that we, that we also developed. And then uh, you've got to go about continuously improving. You can't uh, just stop and say, you know, we've got them old, this is the way it is, we'll just hang on to this one, which is a problem of many organizations. Um, but you've got to work on continuously improving everything you do. 
And then you've got to be able to evaluate what you're doing, doing some internal mechanisms to do that, but also to, like we did in the end of, uh, of the 80s, early, early 90s, we, we encouraged an outside researcher to come in. You know, did we do what we said we were going to do? I mean, that was a very important thing before I retired. I wanted to see, you know, were we able to do this? And then the last step, the seventh step, is for a great extent after I've left, and that is to sustain what you've done. Yeah to carry that on, and in, in, in most cases, I think that that has been pretty done. I, I'm still very, very proud of, uh, of this department and the direction they're going. Um, would I like to see more? Uh, yeah, I'd like to needle them every once in a while and say, let's get going. We've got, uh, we've got 90 seconds left. Sure. What's the path to accomplishing those? Is it, is it police chiefs who say, we need to change? Is it mayors and local officials? Is it citizens saying, we demand this of our, of our police force? Well, it's probably all of that. But the police are such a secretive, uh, 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 silent organization, not very opaque. It's very difficult to use outside pressure to change them. There's not been working historically. The change for police must come from police officers and their leaders. They must, they must grab the vision, they must get their, their hearts on fire, uh, and, and they must move forward. If you want to talk to uh, David Cooper about his book, there are a couple of appearances coming up in Cross Plains at the Crossroads Coffee House on Main Street in Cross Plains, uh, Thursday the 3rd at 7 p.m., and then going back to where the ministry si side of this <laughs> began at uh, St. John's in Portage. What, that's the next Saturday, I think. Yes. Yeah. Three, um, three in the afternoon. And the book is called Arrested Development. Um, like I said, it's available at, at uh, local bookstores, uh, independent bookstores. You can certainly get it through Amazon, and bookstores will order it for you. It's, a, it's a, an amazingly current read given law enforcement today. And, and Chief, thanks very much. It was good to thanks, see you again. Man. Always good to talk to you. We're going to come up back and wrap up for the record right after this. Well, maybe we'll sell a couple. My thanks to David Cooper for joining me today. You can get his book, Arrested Development, on Amazon.com. Next week, we'll get you ready for the upcoming recall primary with our political panel. See you next Sunday.